knows. So there's always that quality of knowing in all of sense experience. Yeah? And that's the illusion of continuity, that, that sense of knowing. Because the knowing is always there. Yeah? <coughs> so, but the objects of the knowing, they are impermanent. And therefore suffering. Yeah? And therefore beyond my control, which means not self. So that's a, that's a more practical way of, 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 of getting into it. Yeah? But whichever way we can get close to that is, is good. We've got to start somewhere. You know? So whatever we experience, um, you know, we can, we can uh, investigate it. Yeah? That's what... what uh, um, Satipatthana, the four foundations of mindfulness, is looking at body, feeling, mind, mind objects. That's what the practice is, and that is supposed to produce insight. Sometimes people talk about insight meditation. I'm practicing insight meditation. You can't practice insight meditation. You can practice whatever it is that leads to insight, because insight is something you get, it's not something you do. Insight is the result of practicing the four foundations of mindfulness. Right? And when you have insight, the mind becomes peaceful because you let go. If you manage to let go through samatha meditation, through watching the breath or a mantra, yeah, when the mind really comes together, it gives you a different perspective and that gives you insight. Yeah? So insight leads to, to calm. Calm leads to insight. Those two, they, they help each other. So, whichever we are more predisposed to, whatever our temperament is, our character, um, then we might be feeling more inclined to use our wisdom faculty. I even use the thinking mind. There's such a thing as right thought in the Buddhist teaching. There's nothing wrong with thinking, so long as we get a handle on that. It's got to be a red thread that we are thinking along. We taka vichara, the initial and applied uh, initial and sustained application of the mind, it needs to be focused. Uh, so we need to bring in other mental factors to keep this thinking in line. Uh, if it's associative thinking, it's a bit like surfing the internet. Oh, I just want to quickly look at the weather. And then three hours later, you're in some cyber realm somewhere on the internet. Uh, that's papancha, that's, that's proliferation. That's, that's the, the ultimate symbol of of uh, the opposite of Nibbana is the internet. I always call the internet Mara's second best. <laughs> you know what the first best is? Well, the opposite sex, of course. So he either gets you, if he doesn't get you through the opposite sex, he gets you through the internet. So be careful. <laughs> yeah, and then thanks for the explanation of the Anatta. I just want to ask, uh, just now when I just say that when the ear hear, the mind know. But I just put the hand pointing to the heart, not pointing to the... Heart, very, heart and mind are always synonymous yes, in Asian culture. It's very interesting that uh, I see the, how I just gesture pointing to the heart. Because from my understanding of what I experience, yes, it is the heart. The, what we talk about heart or mind actually is in the heart not in the brain. Yeah. So, from there on, I want to ask I get Ajahn understand, uh, how to we understand this. So, Ajahn, do Ajahn agree that uh, when we practice more, the more we practice, then when we do something, either we speak or do any action, there will be a vibration in our heart. Be, be what? Sorry? There is a vibration in our heart. Uh-huh, okay. Whether it is good or not good, actually there is a vibration in the heart and it tells us whether it is good or good, not good. It's just because we are not that sensitive or we are not that pay attention to that, that we don't know and we keep asking people hey, whether what I do is right or wrong. Mm-hmm. I give an example, like just now I didn't talk about vichara, vitaka. So when we practice the samatha meditation or when we 
do the meditation and the more we practice, the more we do all this vichara, vitaka, uh, piti, sukha, ekagata, all come itself. And we understand that, oh, this is vichara, oh, this is vitaka. Even we never read oh, what is vichara, what is vitaka. But the more we practice, this kind of five faculty all come out together and, oh, this is this. So, do I just agree that what, what I say just now? Or when we do something, actually there's a vibration in the heart that yes, we know yes. what is right or wrong. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, yeah. for me, it's, I, first of all, you said the, the, the mind is in here and not in here. That it's a nice conventional way of speaking and yes, a lot of the Kubacham would even agree that the mind sits in the heart but the mind has nothing to do with this body. It could be in that cup here. It could be in the corner over there. The mind is not matter. The mind is not material. So where it could be anywhere. But generally speaking, yes. Uh, the reason people point to the head when they say mind and to the heart when they say heart is because they associate thinking with the mind and they associate emotions and feelings with the heart. Yeah? But the two are synonymous. Both thinking and emotion are qualities of the heart or qualities of the mind. It doesn't matter where you point. Uh, you can point to your knee for all I care. Yeah? So it doesn't really matter. But what you said is perfectly right because we experience the more sensitive we become. Um, you call it a vibration and I don't disagree. For me, that feeling is usually in, in more in the area of the solar plexus, a little lower than the heart. And it's usually the feeling when I'm doing something wrong. Yeah? When I'm about to say something that I shouldn't be saying, uh, when I'm about to do something I shouldn't be doing, then that part of my body reacts. Yeah? Um, and that is a way of gauging your skillful or unskillful actions yeah? and we can use that yeah? so knowing what is wholesome and knowing what is unwholesome is actually you remember the Buddha talks about the five hindrances yeah? the last hindrance is doubt and when you look at those suttas where the Buddha describes that a little bit more in detail he says doubt in regard to what yeah? and the Buddha says doubt in regard to what is wholesome and unwholesome. Uh, so, doubt is not about having faith in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, which means, uh, you know, it means a, a Muslim or a Christian couldn't have doubt. Uh, it's got nothing to do with that. Uh, especially in the context of the, the, the first three fetters, Sila uh, Vata Paramasa, Vichikicha, and, and uh, what's the other one? Sakaya Diti, yeah. So, so there you got Vichikicha as, as doubt. Yeah? It's the sort of doubt that says, yes, but. Yeah? Yes, the Buddha was right, but I know better. Yeah? So it's a, kind of, it's a kind of doubt that doesn't really know what is wholesome and unwholesome. Once you've seen the Dhamma, yeah? once you've, you've, you've really seen the Dhamma, once, it, once it's in your heart, there is no doubt as to what is right and wrong. There is no doubt as to what is wholesome and unwholesome. Yeah? Which is why the Sotapanna is incapable of going to the lower realms. Because he's incapable of doing something that is so bad that it will send him to the lower realms. Because he knows what is right and what is wrong. He knows what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. Yeah? That's the level of doubt he's overcome. Yeah? And that's the level of, uh, to which he's overcome the hindrances as well. Yeah? He still has seven lifetimes max to go if he's, you know, so inclined. But at least the, all these lifetimes, they will not be in any realm of, of woe. That'd be at least human realm. Yeah. And that's, that's because of, you know, doubt has been overcome. Yeah. And there is no more uh, view, wrong view, in regard to these things that make up our experience as self yeah. because they've been seen as, as 
formations. Formations, sankhara, is one of those things that I really encourage people to look into because in the whole of the Buddhist world, whether it's Sri Lanka, Burma, even Thailand, uh, there's been so much wrong view spread through the, through the post-canonical literature uh, with regard to, the, to Sankara. Uh, because if you just look at the simplest teachings of the Buddha about formations, he says there are bodily formations, there are verbal formations, and there are mental formations. Uh, so why do you then have to go and explain Sankara in other terms in other contexts. That's not how the Buddha taught. There's a continuity in the Buddha's teachings. You can read the Dhamma from the, of the Buddha from A to Z and you are guaranteed you will not find one single contradiction except one based on your own misunderstanding. But once you get into the commentary literature yeah, where people who are not, who are not enlightened say, well, this is what the Buddha said, but what he actually meant is this. <laughs> I mean, how arrogant and conceited can you be? Yeah? Which doesn't mean you have to throw all these teachings out. I mean, they have value, they have uh, things to offer, but you've got to read them with that in mind. It's like it's like you hear a, an Indian f folk story. Yeah? You know that most of it is just complete fabrications. Yeah? But it may have a moral there. It may, there may be something there. Yeah? So that's how you can read the commentaries. If they explain something that you didn't know before and it doesn't contradict what the Buddha actually said, then you can take it on board. Yeah? But Sankara, because... We all practice, most of us practice breath meditation, right? A lot of us do the breath meditation. Yeah? Did it ever occur to you that the breath is a sankhara? That the breath is a formation? Yes? Yeah, wonderful. That's, that's what I like to hear. Because that's what the Buddha said at the end of the first tet tetrad of the Anapanasati Sutta. He says, calming the bodily formations, I shall breathe in. Calming the bodily formations, I shall breathe out. But it presupposes that you know that the breath is actually the bodily formation. But what does it mean that it is a formation? You're talking about non-self, so we're circling back to that. If it's a formation, if it's a sankhara, it means it's conditioned. That's what sankharas are. They arise because of causes persist and cease. Yeah? And that's what the breath does. If you breathe in, you don't breathe out, you're dead, fire, finished, gone. Yeah? So, the breath is what conditions your body, is what forms your body, what keeps your body going. Yeah? But it's not yours. Because whether you watch your breath or you don't watch your breath, the breath doesn't care. Yeah? And the body still keeps going. So if you get to that level in your meditation where you can just sit back and say, breath, you do your thing, you know what you're doing, yeah? and I just watch. Yeah? So you've got the breath breathing and the mind knowing. At two separate realities. Yeah? It's no longer I am breathing in, I am breathing out. It's not me, not mine, not myself. As long as it's still me, mine, myself, then I'm controlling the breath. And as long as I'm controlling the breath, it's never going to be peaceful. But if I recognize the breath as a sankhara, which is nature, it's dhamma, it's nature. Yeah? I can watch the birds. I don't have to control the birds. I can listen to the wind in the trees. I don't have to control the wind. Why do I have to control my breath when it goes in and out? Because I'm a control freak. Because I think it's my breath. Because I'm supposed to do something with the breath. Yeah. And that's the first big hurdle that we need to overcome. If we can just sit back, kick back even, and just watch the breath doing its thing. That's when the meditation, that's when the breath can calm down. That's when the, the kaya sankara, the bodily formation, will calm down. 
Why? Because you're leaving it alone. That's why things calm down, because you take yourself out of the equation. You're no longer there controlling it. And then you see non-self. So even at that level of the Anapanasati Sutta, you can gain a hell of a lot of insight into the true nature of our existence by seeing the breath as a formation. If you truly see it, and the mind lets go, that's the perfect opportunity for deep insight, profound insight. And you transfer that, or you infer that, to, uh, what is it, verbal formations, vitaka vichara, in mental formations, uh, perception and feeling, you're home, you're almost home. Because you've got almost all the five khandas there. There's this consciousness missing. So, seeing these things as sankharas, uh, seeing the breath as a sankhara, seeing thinking as a sankhara, seeing feeling and perception as a sankhara, if you let them all go, you're as good as finished with the job. It's not me, not mine, not myself. <coughs> well, anybody else got any interesting Thank question? You. Yes? Thank you, Aja. Uh, Thanks for coming to Singapore. Um, I'm thinking, how do we handle extreme, unwholesome mental state? And yourself? Myself? Um, well, is it at myself or at other things? Um, I find it difficult to let go or meditate or sleep or stand metta, think about good things, to uplift myself especially in extreme states. I think the intermediate states or the early stages, meditation, uh, listening to Dharma, this helps. But towards the extreme states, it seems that I just have to wait it out until yeah, I get to and exhaustion. You, and, and you do. Yeah, and you do. Yeah. I mean, the, the, Buddha gives the, the, the Buddha gives a gradual... Yeah, it's karma, yeah, of course. The Buddha gives a gradual approach to that. He said, the best thing you do is you swap one for the other. So if you have an unwholesome mind state yeah, and you recognize it's an unwholesome mind state, if you have cultivated, developed and practiced wholesome mind states and you have access to them, then you supplement them. So if you're angry, you recognize anger is unwholesome but you've practiced enough loving kindness you get, you get that, you can bring up that perception of loving kindness you bring up that feeling of warmth and, 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 and happiness in the heart, you bring that up and you swap, you, you change one for the other. Yeah? If that doesn't work, huh, then you, 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 the next thing you can do is, is um, something like, um, I can't remember the order the Buddha teaches it. Anybody remember that? I think it's M18 or something, one of these early suttas in the Majjhima. I think the next one the Buddha says is um, um, ah, come on, where are the Sutta, sutta Geeks? Uh, yeah? No, 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 no. He, he, gives, he gives five, he gives, it's, it's called, it's called, uh, it's a, it's a successful, a successive way of dealing with unwholesome thoughts. Um, well, let's, let's I'll just tell you the ones I remember. One is ignoring it, completely ignoring it. Yeah? Ignoring means basically you don't look at it. But it also means you're looking at something else. So, so you, gotta dis- you can even distracting yourselves would be valid at that point. Yeah? So you just need a clean break from that. If you, you try to get a handle on that, you know you can't because it's so overwhelming that if you stay with it, it keeps, it keeps overwhelming you. Right? So you need a completely clean break. You've got to do something completely different. Right? That's ignoring it and right? getting, getting out of it. Then there's contemplating the danger of it. Yeah? So recognizing the fact that it is an unwholesome state of mind and that it's actually dangerous because it's conditioning your mind. Yeah? 
you condition your mind in that way, it will break into speech and action. Uh, eventually the mind inclines in that direction. You can remem- remind yourself of all the suffering that unwholesome mind states cause in the future because you can remember them from the past. You can reflect back on the past. In the past, these unwholesome mind states have caused me that so, so much suffering. So it's basically using your wisdom faculty yeah, to see the danger in that. Yeah, and making that danger so abundantly clear that the mind shies, shies away from it and lets, lets it go. Yeah. Anybody found the second one yet? No. And the last one yeah, is if nothing else works, yeah, like a strong man takes a weak man and he just holds him down. Yeah. It's like you beat down mind with mind. You force yourself out of that state. Yeah. But that's only a last resort. But sometimes, before you before that unwholesome mind, mental state turns into physical or, or verbal kamma, uh, because our, our mental kamma, remember, that's, that's not part of sila. That's the wisdom faculty. Uh, in the Eightfold Path, you've got right view and right thought. And those two are the vi- wisdom aspect. If you, if you take the, you know, they, they have the sila, samadhi, panya, uh, virtue, meditation, and wisdom. Uh, so the Eightfold Path in short, is is virtue, meditation, and wisdom. So the wisdom part is the first factor, which is right view, and the second factor is right thought. Then you've got your whole sila, what is it, right speech, right action, right livelihood. And then you've got right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, and they are pertaining to the samadhi aspect. So, your unwholesome mind states, they are not yet committing bad sila, but they're still committing kama, mental kama, which means if you keep indulging in those thoughts, yeah, the mind will incline in that direction, which means eventually it will break into speech and action, and that's when you will create kama, based on that, that, that mental, mental action that you've cultivated. So those are the kind of things you reflect on when you reflect on the danger of unwholesome mind states. How, because they're conditioning. Yeah? The Buddha once said, I read that, I first read that, I thought it was, what's that mean? He said, why, the Buddha was asked, why are formations called formations? Yeah? And the Buddha said, formations are called formations because they form the formed. Which is brilliant, because if you look at the English translation of Sankara, conditioned phenomena, I mean, that doesn't actually give you the whole range of Sankara, because it's, it's, it's like this fixed, this is a conditioned phenomena. Stop. Huh? No. Yes, it is a conditioned phenomena, but it's also conditioning. It has been conditioned, and it is conditioning. So it's active and passive. And that gets lost in the translation of conditioned phenomena. So that's why I like to call it formations. Or if you like it even more simple, conditions. Formations is a word that most people in in daily life, they they don't use that, formations. Asantanisaro had another one, what do you have? Fermentations. So it gets wilder and wilder. Yeah? So it's like fermented pork, you know, you ferment your thoughts or something like that. You know, it's like, how do you deal with all these translations? You got to make you, you got to make yourself understand what they mean. Yeah? And if you understand that formations are formations because they form, they keep on forming what has already been formed. Yeah? Your breath is formed, is conditioned already. But it also keeps conditioning. Your thoughts have been conditioned. But they also keep conditioning. Your perceptions, your feelings, they are conditioned. But yes, they they, they keep conditioning. So the active and passive aspect of Sankara is very, very important to bear in mind. Because it's happening all the time. And we're creating karma all the time. And what you're referring to is manokamma, that's mental karma. Yeah? It's not bad sila, but it's likely to go in that direction when it turns into speech 
and, and action. Uh, and so, basically, the short answer to your question is make effort. Uh, but making effort means you've got to really want to get rid of it. If you've got an addiction, if you've got something or else, other that, that is, 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 uh, a play, is, a play, is plaguing you, uh, you've got to want to get out of it. And quite often, the best way to get out of something is through a change of environment, through changing the circumstances which will always put you back and create the conditions that lead in that direction. Yeah. Say, um, you got, you got bad friends yeah, who always badmouth everybody else and they always drag everything down and they're always complaining and they're always whining and bitching and they're always creating a bad mood. Yeah? And that drags you down as well. So you're getting into these kind of mental states as well. Yeah? So the only way to get out of it or the best way to get out of it is just not to see these people anymore. Nobody's forcing you to see them. Yeah? Sometimes you make, you've got to make a clean break with people that are stupid. We're not, we're not fated to be around stupid people for the rest of our lives. Yeah? Some, people, some stupid people we have to endure because we can't get out of it. But if we have a choice, yeah, we better make the right choices. Yeah? The Buddha said to be around wise people, to be around good people, to be around kind people. Yeah? Because that will also, in fact, in, in, uh, influence the way we, we think and we talk and we act. So, but you gotta, you got to really make that effort and do something about it. But check it out. It's, what is it, much in my 18, is it, or something like that? Huh? 20. 20, okay, one of those early ones. So, so read, read it one. You got the uh, number two, uh, was the danger. Yeah, what was the second one? I forget the that. The danger was number two. Number three was um, when, when he tries to forget. Yeah, those uh-huh. thoughts ignoring. And number four is the one that was missed up. He gives attention to stealing the thought formation of those thoughts. Ah, this, this is the one I forgot. Okay, so I got the order more or less, but I forgot that one. And the fourth one. It's, the, it's an interesting one. It's the most strange and, and, and difficult to understand for most people, and myself included. But it's about stealing the thought formations, which is, what is it? No, we went back to Sankara's uh, formations, mm-hmm. thought formations, mm-hmm. Vitaka Vichara. Yeah. So it's our thinking. The thinking the thinking needs to be stilled. Yeah. So that which actually forms, yeah, the, the thinking that, that, that goes on, we can trace it back. Yeah. And then the Buddha gives a simile, he said, well, you've you got to slow the process down. And the Buddha gives a simile, he said, a man is walking, uh, or is walking fast, and he says, oh, I'm walking fast. Why am I walking fast? I could walk slow. So he walks slowly. Uh, and then he says, well, why am I even walking slowly? I could just stand. And so he stands. And then he thinks, well, why am I standing? I could just sit down. So he sits down. And then he thinks, well, why am I just sitting around here? I could just lie down. And so he lies down. Uh, so it's like you're, you're taking it apart. You, you're taking these things apart, but it's it's a tricky one. It's it's one that I I don't even feel really adequate in explaining it. But it's it's uh, it, it presupposes that we can uh, grasp those things that form these thoughts, uh, and you got to you got to trace them back. This was the last thought, and that was the thought before. And sometimes what you then realize is the associativeness of this thinking. It's asso- they, they call it associative thinking. It's like you see cup and then you say tea and then you take tea and think about China and all of a sudden you're in Kunming or somewhere. Yeah? Yeah? It's like yeah, it's not using that red thread I talked about earlier. Yeah? And if you, if, you find, if you see that then you can just allow you can, it's like you're taking the process apart and then it it crumbles, it, 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 it slows down. Yeah. But again, it's, 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 but try, try it out, whatever works. You know. Yeah. 
I um, hear many statements mentioning that uh, Buddhism is not a religion. So, can you help clarify? Can we say Buddhism is a religion because we have Lord Buddha? Um, uh, beats me. I mean, it doesn't really matter what you call it. I mean, religion. Uh, what is religion? I mean, the thing with, with these, these words, I mean, they're, 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 just, they're just ways of trying to determine. It's certainly not a theistic religion, yeah, because we don't have a theos, we don't have a creator God. So in that sense, it's not a religion, because all other religions are. Um, but then if you look at the basic teachings of all religions, I mean, they all talk about that it makes sense to be virtuous, they all talk about, at least the mystical traditions, at some point talk about some form of meditation. You got the Christian mystics, you got the desert fathers, you got, you got the Sufis in Islam. Uh, so you, you have these mystic traditions where people realize that the training of the mind in, in meditation is, is a very important ingredient. Um, instilling wisdom. Um, I mean, I, I, I honestly, I don't feel it needs, it, I, don't need, I don't feel the question needs to be answered. Yeah? Because the Buddha called it sasana, yeah? which is like a teaching. Yeah? And what does he teach? Yeah? He teaches a path to liberation. Yeah? So, so take those words that the Buddha uses to describe himself, the Dhamma and the Sangha, and we chant Iti Piso, yeah, and make up your own definition of what Buddhism is. Because the Buddha never called it Buddhism. That's us finding some ism. Yeah? It's, the Buddha never called it Buddhism. Yeah? So, I just like to call it Bhavana, which is a cultivation. And then when you look at it closer, the Buddha, when he talks about bhavana, he talks about uh, uh, chitta bhavana, but he also talks about kaya bhavana. Uh, so it's like the development, cultivation of body and mind. Uh, because those are the two things that make up our experience, is the body and the mind. Uh, and then within the body you have the speech. Uh, so if you look at it, it's, it's cultivating good kamma, first of all, through body, speech and mind. And then eventually, taking it further, where you realize that, hey, it doesn't matter how much good karma I make, yeah, it's like going on a holiday with a lot of cash. Eventually, you run out of cash. You've got to come back home. Yeah, same thing, you go to heaven. Yeah, it's a great holiday. I wouldn't mind going to Tusita next, right, next time around. Certainly don't want to come to this crazy world again. I mean, it's getting crazier and crazier out there. Have you ever noticed? The world is going nuts. Huh? And it's more complicated. I mean, I feel sorry for all these old people who are not forced online and forced to have one of these stupid phones. You know? It's like, what's happening to the world? Huh? And then they're asking about meditation. Huh? The first thing I tell people if they want to meditate is get rid of the phone. But it's like, you can't stop it. It's impossible. My parents come to me and they say, Ah, oh, how can I train my child not to use the mobile so much and be st all the, on the social networks all the time and being on the internet all the time? Ah, I'm saying, good luck. <laughs> it's like, what can you do, you know? You forbid them, then they're angry at you. You take it away, they're angry at you. You restrict it, they're angry at you. And they're always going to be angry at you. So, if, you have, if you're okay with that, then take it away. It's okay. <laughs> no, anyway, but it's like, it's, 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 it's crazy. Yeah? But going to heaven is like that. You know, if you have, if you have good, good karma, you can go there for a while. But eventually, you've got to come back. And that's why the, the Buddha is the only, the only one who teaches a way out of rebirth. 
So karma is, is still t- attachment, is still self. Okay, the, the second question. Uh, in Buddhism, the word God, is it referring to Diva or lower level Diva? Can you explain a bit? Well, in Buddhism, the word God in that sense, in the, in, in the, in the, in the theistic sense, doesn't, doesn't exist. But if you... I mean, that's why I encourage people to read the suttas. I mean, there's a sutta where the Buddha goes, and goes to the Brahma world and he talks to Brahma, which is like the Buddhist equivalent of God because he's the closest uh, that we come to uh, in, in the suttas. Because Saka is, is God, obviously. He's the king of the... King of the uh, 32, is it? Yeah. Uh, 33, yeah. I'm not good with numbers. Anyway, so, but Brahma, he is the one who perceives himself as a creator. Yeah? So, that's the closest in the Buddhist scriptures. And, and so the Buddha goes up to him and, he, and this Brahma goes on and he, he's, he's giving him the whole spiel of how he's like impermanent and everlasting and how he's been here and he's created all these wonderful things. And the Buddha said, sorry mate, you're not. Imper- you're impermanent. Yeah? I've been in your shoes before. Yeah? So he teaches Brahma and he really gets afraid because for the first time he realizes that he's not permanent. He thought himself to be permanent. So you got all these suttas. So yes, when you talk about devas, uh, it's like a general term for heavenly beings, because obviously there's not just one god, or two gods, or three gods, uh, but there's whole communities of, of heavenly beings. And, uh, and yes, there is a hierarchy there as well. There's the, the, the fiddlers, the gandabas, they make good music, it's like the, the rock bands in our world. And then you got the, the Nagas and the uh, Garudas and the Yakas and got all these beings and the, the, uh, those realms that pertain to the four elements. Yeah? They're close to this earth still, those four, Tatumaratika, the four great kings. And then above that you got the higher devas. And of course these realms, they become successively more subtle and sublime until you go beyond the five sense world, and that's where Brahma resides. So, yeah, you can call them gods, you can call them devas, angels, heavenly beings, whatever. Okay, the last question. Uh, many Dharma uh, wishes us to be happy and well, so can we be having many happy activities, chanting, singing, uh, parties, etc.? Huh? What was that? I didn't get oh, the uh, many dharma have uh, wished us to be happy and well. Many, many who? Dharma. Many, many dharma. Uh, who is many dharma? Sutta. Huh? Sutta. Many sutta. What do they do? They wish us to be well and happy. And that's that. And that means what? That's a justification yeah. for yeah. what? Can we have uh, many happy activities? Have a few things? drinks and. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can, you can justify it whichever way you want. I mean, it's like, I mean, being well and happy, it depends on the level of your wisdom, what that means to you. Uh, if you're a, a passionate gambler and drinker, then being happy and well means to go to the casino and make some money and get pissed off your, you know, head of your mind to the point that you can't even walk home. You need a taxi. I mean, that's, that's a, the happiness of a gambler. Yeah? But then there's different levels of happiness, obviously. And the highest happiness is Nibbana. So whatever is in between, uh, you can try and look where you find yourself there. Yeah? So... I talked initially about mudita chit, which is like the uh, uh, rejoicing um, in the goodness of others. Yeah? So, for instance, when I rejoice in the happiness and well-being of others, yeah, I can rejoice in somebody just winning a million dollars in the casino. I can rejoice in that. 
I can rejoice in someone who's made a determination to keep the five precepts as a completely different level, as a completely different ball game. Yeah? Or somebody comes and he says, oh, I made a breakthrough. I think I've, I've seen the Dhamma. I've, I've uh, you know, realized the Dhamma. Then I can rejoice in that. Yeah? So it's like wishing well and wishing happiness it depends on the degree to which you understand suffering. If you haven't understood suffering, if you haven't seen suffering, which you haven't seen the Four Noble Truths, then your understanding of happiness is obviously a completely different understanding of happiness than that of one who actually seen suffering. Yeah? And it's the same with the Brahma Vihara, the uh, 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 Metta Karuna Murita Upeka. If you've seen the Dhamma, then your level of loving kindness will be of a completely different order and also your level of compassion. Because once you really see suffering, then you know what compassion is. It means you want these people to be free from suffering. Yeah? But if you haven't even seen suffering, if you still think suffering is if you hit yourself on the thumb with a hammer, uh, then obviously that's not the same. You know? But you can still wish people not to hit themselves with a hammer, but it's not the same. Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah, Ajahn. Um, earlier on, you talked about the Petta world, so it got me to look into the Janasuni Sutta. Yeah, sorry, the Janasuni Sutta. The what um, Sutta? Janasuni Sutta. Uh -huh. Do you know what you call that? Um, anyway, can I read something for you? Because of the question going to that, it says that um, these people who are Sorry, these beings who are reborn in the girl's realm, there they survive feeding on the food of the beings in a girl's realm, or else they survive feeding on what friends and colleagues, relatives and kin provide them with from here. Yeah. Now, the question here is, from here, meaning the human world, yeah. so on our You're part, do we, do we provide food for them? I mean, yeah. how is that done? We yeah, even putting, the, you know, the spirit houses... Spirit houses where people put food and yeah, drinks. I thought that was more like superstitious, but you know, but yeah, let's say at home myself, do I put the food? Well, that, that, what um, I was I was just going to say that they're obviously not drinking that that whiskey you put there or that that rice dish or that sweet, yeah. But what they're eating is your your well wishing, your intention of giving that. Your act of giving is is all. There is a mental component to that that is not material. So, you put a cup of tea there and you say, may, this, this is for you. Yeah? So, that act of giving is what, what they feed on. In the, in the more non-Buddhist traditions, more the esoteric, so-called esoterical traditions, they call it ode. Uh, which is, a, which is it's like a <clears throat> it's like a mental energy that they feed on. Okay. It's like beings in those realms and even in the in the in the in the demon realms, yeah, they feed off our energy. Yeah? So if you're a lustful character or you're a hateful character, yeah, you have a certain aura, you have a certain vibe, yeah? and that is a mental. It's a mental thing, yeah? and that is what these beings feed on. Yeah? You go to you go to a, a pub where there's a lot of drinking, a lot of unwholesome talking. There's a lot of you know talking about just common worldly pursuits, yeah? the energy there is one that attracts certain beings from the other realm. Yeah? Whereas places where there is a wholesome energy, where people talk about Dhamma, there is there's, 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 there's a lot of a kindness and there's a sort of uh, rejoicing in, in goodness and, and, and uh, virtue. Yeah? There are certain beings who can't even go near there because they are not attracted to that and they're actually repelled by that. So, it's, it's, we're talking about mental energy here. So, your intention, yeah, your, your chetana, your, your wishing, your well-wishing, that mental energy is what they feed on. Yeah? Right. So, you don't really have to give the food. You can just think about the thought of a food 
presenting to them. Well, I don't know about the exact mechanics. If you say, oh, I give you this, I give you this cup of tea, and there is no cup of tea, huh? <laughs> and he's just going to say, are you kidding me? Where's my cup of tea? <laughs> Sorry, it's just me trying to understand the sutta. What's trying to say? Do we actually do it? Do we actually present? the food and all that, or it's just a thought, because I'm just confused, because now you're saying... No, read thought. exactly what it says, because you take it literally. It, it, it does give me an impression that I've actually produced the food, but then I was thinking... Well, what does it say about food? food? No, I don't no, think so. No, but exactly. That is just, um, what is the actual food? wording? What does it say? Okay, this is just a translation from Ajahn Sujato, so let me just... Oh, he's it. pretty good. Yeah, I know, I know. He says that... Um, Okay, that part. Or else they survive feeding on what friends and colleagues, relatives and kin provide them from. Exactly. Here. So it's completely uh, neutral. Uh, which means anything you give with the intention of it being for them is what that means. Uh, so you can yeah. keep the eight precepts yeah, and you give the good that comes from you keeping the eight precepts to them. So you're not looking at the word feeding, because feeding, I'm trying to think of food. Well, it doesn't say about feeding. It's nothing to do with feeding. Well, feeding, I'm oh, sorry, feeding is like a fire feeds as well. It feeds on wood. So it means feeding, you can feed on bad energy. And right. You can feed on good energy. It's a, it's a completely, it's a word that you can, it's neutral. It doesn't mean material, necessarily mean material food. The Buddha was once asked, sorry, yeah. the Buddha was once asked, if a being has departed from this world, but has not yet ar ar arrived in the other world, what sustains that being? Uh, that was a very interesting answer. He said, tanha, craving. Uh, yeah. You read any of the ghost stories, uh, you find the more craving that being has in that state, the more it produces that by which we can actually see these beings. Most of us don't see ghosts. Yeah? But there are many ghost stories where many people simultaneously have seen a being who was a ghost. Yeah? There are occurrences where people go and they see exactly the same. Yeah? And, and that being yeah, that they see is... Is, is, is putting out um, this kind of whatever it is that makes us see them but it is through the, through the power of craving yeah? so craving is actually what sustains these beings so it's also a, f a way of feeding yeah? right but the sentence before that it says that there does they survive feeding on the food so that actually uses the word food yeah ahara Ahara, the five hindrances are the food for, for delusion, the Buddha said. So oh, food is also okay. a nutriment. Okay, yep, I, see that I bet you it's, I bet you the word is, is Ahara. Aharo, okay. Aharo. Is it? Does it even say the Pali? Satanam Aharo. Nanda, Nanda. Ahara is, Ahara means nutriment. It's neutral, it's not material yeah, food. Okay. Yeah. Consciousness is a food. Okay. Feeling, perception, they're all you know, because the five hindrances are food for ignorance, for, 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 for not knowing, for delusion. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. But people sometimes they take it too literal. What is? I think that I should present food, but you say they do. They do. What, whatever act of goodness, whatever act of kindness, whatever act of giving, whatever act of letting go, charity, chaga, dana, whatever you want to call it, whatever you do, it is your mental determination that makes it into that which they can partake of. By forming that, forming that wish in your mind, may these beings be able to partake of the the goodness that arises from my practice or from my sharing or from my cup of tea. Yeah? That makes sense? Yes. Better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> One more here. Can we have other stuff? Thank 
Hi again. May I know like how to a bit louder because uh, it's very uh, difficult here. Uh, uh, hi again. Uh, may I know how to differentiate whether we are already um, letting go or we are just being delusion, like being indifferent? Let, letting go? How do we know whether we are already letting go certain things or we are just still in delusion, like we are just being indifferent? <clears throat> well, letting go, letting go is... I mean, look look at it as a practical thing. It's like letting go. What are we actually letting go of? What, what are the things we're letting go is recommended by the Buddha. Yeah. So when we do do charity, do practice generosity, that's a form of letting go. That's a form of renunciation. Yeah. If you get up in the morning, you prepare a nice meat, you go to the monastery, you offer it with your own hands. There's a lot of effort, there's a lot of action, there's a lot of giving, so that's a form of letting go. It's, it's what the Buddha called chaga. Yeah. Keeping five precepts is a form of letting go. You're letting go of bad things, you keep doing good things. Keeping eight precepts is a form of letting go because you let go of even more. Yeah? Now, talking about the big letting go of greed, hatred and delusion, yeah? so to, to which extent are you able to let go of, first of all, unwholesome thoughts. Yeah? And then thoughts altogether. Because you realize, hey, it's much more peaceful to sit here and watch my breath and be, be silent than listen to these stupid thoughts. You're always telling me the same things anyway. If you can do that, then it means, wow, you've, you've let go to, to quite a degree if you're able to see these thoughts as sankaras, because that's what they are. They, they are verbal formations. They're not me, not mine, not a self. So I have to listen to them. Yeah? If you've known that, if you've seen that, then these thoughts, they, you, it's like you're taking the nutriment away. Yeah? You're taking the nutriment away because you can't forbid the thoughts from thinking. Yeah? But the more you realize that they've always been lying to you, they've always been deceiving you, most of the time they're a waste of time, the more you realize that with wisdom, the more you take away the nutriment because they're feeding on your delusion. They're feeding on your five hindrances. They're feeding on you believing in them as you, yours, yourself. And the less you believe that, the more you take away the nutriment. And then the thoughts will actually fade by themselves because they're not, you can't say stop thought. A thought stops or it doesn't stop because of conditions. But you've got to create the right conditions. So if you're in your meditation, you find out that, well, yeah, for me it's, it's quite easy to just stay with the breath. The thinking disappears pretty quickly. I can just be happy. I get nice energy, good feeling. Then, yeah, you've let, let go of a lot, I would say. You know? And then, the, you know, then the other parts is when, when uh, things don't go the way you want in life. You know, people make you angry. People make you sad. Uh, can you let go when it hurts? That's the big test. Uh, because wisdom, my definition of wisdom, and this is my own, came up with that on my own, but I think it's a fair description. Uh, true wisdom is the ability to let go when it hurts. Uh, because everybody can let go when it doesn't hurt, uh, but when it really hurts, can we let go? Yeah. When things don't go the way we want them to go, yeah. is that, can we let go then and still be peaceful? Yeah. And that's the big, that's the big ones. But you can, <coughs> you can always test yourself yeah, by, you know, the the, the 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 ease with which you're keeping the precepts, the ease with which you can get into meditation and the ease with which you can just avoid suffering over things you can't control anyway. Those are the tests. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay. Anyone else? There's one more here. There's no one else over there. 
for obvious first. Okay, I just want to state uh, regarding her question, I uh, just want to add, understand during Bimbi Sara time, uh, his ancestor so-called came to disturb him and uh, Buddha advised him to offer to the Sangha food and uh, transfer the merit to them. Then they have food and they appear naked. <laughs> and Buddha advised them, uh, him to offer clothing to the Sangha and transfer Mari to them, then they have uh, clothing. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, can, you see, I mean, I, I remember when I was in, in Australia with Lumpur Pli and, and there was a, was a family and they had a handicapped child. It was, a, um, I don't know, I guess a bit slow or whatever, like mm -hmm. retarded. And uh, he recommended to make him offer um, requisites like things you need to study, like pens and pencil and paper and stuff that kids would need in school, uh, to the Sangha. Uh, and he said that would, that would help, help him. So it's like, it's the act of giving to the Sangha, obviously, then if, if, if the Sangha, especially if the Sangha is pure with the Buddha at the, at the head of it, obviously it was an enormous amount of merit, but then the, the, the gift that is being given obviously has also a significance there. Hi, Ajahn. Um, I want to ask how do we measure our progress in meditation year as year goes by, like into our, our nine, year, ten year, twenty years, thirty years. What is the yardstick we should use for ourselves? Because we are not in a monastery that we have like the seniors to take care of. It's 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 not so easy to gauge, but I find I find sometimes it's like other people will see that in us more than we ourselves because we're too close to ourselves huh? and uh, <clears throat> quite frankly the, the, the first jump from not being a meditator, not being a practitioner to then being a practitioner, being a meditator, that's incredible. Huh? But then there seems to come this long road huh? and uh, unfortunately that's how it works, seems to work for most people. And even monks, you know, if, if like, uh, you know, I mean, there's stories even in the suttas, you know, where nuns and monks have been practicing for 20 years and they didn't get anywhere. Uh, um, it, really, it really isn't up to us. Uh, but progress, to me, is the real, realization that there's nothing else to do anyway. You get, to the, you get to that stage where you know that I just got to keep going. You know, I got to keep doing good. Uh, I got to keep the precepts. I got to keep being a good human being. And if I have the time to train my mind, I do it. Yeah. But the train, the, the mind is stubborn. It's more stubborn than your more stubborn child. Yeah. And uh, it just... You know, it, it just, that's why we, we need to really use all the skillful means that we can come up with uh, to keep going in that direction. You know. and there's many different skillful means, but we also need to find the ones that work for us. Uh, like out of this, these five things we read out from the suttas, how to go against unskillful thoughts. Uh, one may work better than the other. Uh, and again, it's like some people, they just incline more towards peace, towards stillness, yeah? and they, they find it quite easily, easy to still the mind. And other people, they just, their minds are just all over the place. You know? So, you know, some people, they need to use more their wisdom faculty and think and reflect and ponder yeah, and read the suttas and get this this, this all-round grasp at this, this profound teaching of the Buddha. 
uh, for it to all make sense. <clears throat> but in terms of when the Buddha was asked that very same question, and he would always say, well, if, if unwholesome states in the mind increase, you're doing something wrong. If unwholesome states in the mind decrease, you're doing something right. If wholesome states in the mind decrease, you're doing something wrong. If wholesome states in your mind increase, you're doing something right. So that wholesome, or the tip I gave to the girl over here, where you just look, look at, well, how difficult is it still for you to make the mind peaceful? And, uh, or, or ability to let go under certain circumstances. There are many ways of gauging your progress but uh, we're so success oriented that quite often we, uh, we miss the finer realities of w what's actually going on. And that's why sometimes it's actually good to have a good friend, a really good friend, is someone who, uh, who can also criticize us or can also um, tell us how we actually uh, appear or make progress. Okay. How long do you usually go in these sessions? You know, an hour and a half or uh, two? No. <laughs> huh? The most is another half hour. Uh, yeah. Or else we will usually end in one and a half hours. Yeah, it's good enough. You know, it's good. Is that okay with Ajahn? Yeah, yeah. Then, uh, how about what is this? Uh, uh, how to say uh, insight? How how do we define and actually how did this insight transform our mind? So I give an example that when the Buddha story when a man called Tisa meet uh, one of the five ascetic uh, Feneva Asaji. When he heard, he transformed. He become a Sotapan. We also heard this kind of teaching also. How you can how listen to it a million times and it still yeah. won't work. So how how do we call uh, insight and how do you transform, change the quality of the mind? Okay. Well, like like I said, there is. Insight should lead to peace. I mean, that's the whole point. And true peace should lead to insight because true peace gives you perspective because you've, you've never experienced it before. It's like Lumpur Shah used to say, we're born with a, with, a, with a rope around our neck and two men pulling on either side, choking us. That's how we get born into this world. You know what the rope is? What? What's the rope? What does the rope stand for? Hmm? Ah, it's the five hindrances. The five hindrances. Sensual desire, ill will, Sloth and torpor, restlessness and remorse, and doubt. But the kings, the king and queen of those five hindrances, uh, is obviously, or the, the, that's just calling the king his sensual desire. If you read the gradual training in different contexts, or you look at the, the way the Buddha describes the hindrances, uh, it's like that which is chief there is, is that, that concern with, with sensuality. That giving ourselves to experiencing through the senses. Because everything arises from that. Yeah. So, what insight then does, as Lumpur Shah said, so basically you have this liking and disliking. Yeah. That's basically what it is. We either want something or we don't want something. Yeah. And that's what makes up the hindrances, really. We want something in this realm. In this realm of sight, sound, smell, taste and touch. 
Or we don't want something in that realm, sight, sound, smell, taste and touch. Yeah? You either want something or you don't want something. Yeah? So that's the strong man. I, one is pulling in that direction, the other one is pulling in that direction. Now I want, now I don't want. This I like, this I don't like. He is nice, he is not nice. Yeah? So, but we're born like that. And we don't know anything different. Yeah? And for the first time that that rope is loosened is when you get into samadhi. When the mind experiences true peace. When the, when the five hindrances are actually disappear for the first time. And there's actual peace. And, and that very peace without desire and aversion without sloth and torpor, without restlessness and remorse, without doubt, yeah, will produce insight in so far as it gives you a completely different perspective on our usual experience of life. Yeah. And through insight into the nature of our experience of life will lead to peace. Yeah. So, it's those two things that, that work together. So, insight should lead to letting go. Insight should lead to peace. If it doesn't, it's not true insight. And if it's a deep insight, a profound insight, then something should be cut off which will never arise again. That's when you're talking about Sodapana, Sakaragami, Anagami, Ahat. That kind of insight produces the cutting off of defilements. But most small insights, the Mickey Mouse insights, as I call them sometimes, yeah, they should at least give you some sense of peace, or more better understanding, <coughs> or a better way to dealing with the problem, or whatever. But they gives you a sense of peace, it gives you a sense of contentment. So, yeah. Is that enough? Or you want to come back on that? Or? You know? I think we can call it a night. Okay. Good enough. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Someone here is supposed to take me to wherever I'm supposed to stay. Yeah. Good. Okay, we can pay respects. Good uh, uh, huh? uh, Can we you have uh, announcements? To share, no, to sh uh, share merits as well as a uh, short blessing. Yeah. So we, what do we do? Chant imina or something? Uh, or what do we do? Oh, idang me, yaki nang hoftu. So I I lead as well or something. Uh, yes. Okay. Idang me nyati nang otu sukita onju nyata yo. Idang me nyati nang otu sukita onju nyata yo. Idang me nyati nang otu sukita onju nyata yo. Samba bunna nupawe na samba dhamma nupawe na samba sangha nupawe na bunna ratanang dhamma ratanang sangha ratanang tenang ratananang anupawe na chatura siti sahasa dhamma khanda Nupawe na pitaka taya, nupawe na chenna sawaka, nupawe na sambe te roka, sambe te maya, sambe te antaraya, sambe te upatawa, sambe te dunimeta, sambe te awamangala, Vinna Santu Ayuattako Tanawattako Sirivattako 
yasavattako balavattako vannavattako sukavattako hotu sambada dukkaro kapaya vera soka sat chupattava anekantaraya pivinna santu chateta sa chaya siddhi dhanang lambam sati bhagyam sukham palam siri ayucha vanno cha pokam undi chaya sava sattava satcha ayucha jiva siddhi bhavantu te mavatu samba mangalam rakhantu samba devata samba bunna anupavena satta sati bhavantu te mavatu samba mangalam rakhantu samba devata samba dhamma anupavena satta sati bhavantu te Avatu samba mangalam rakhantu samba devata samba sanghanu mavena sata sati mavantu te. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.